Okay, well, I, it's lovely. It's lovely to have you all and uh, this morning, and uh, we're really pleased to welcome Paul, Paul Gillingham, who you remember did a talk for us um, just before Christmas on on traveling across Spain the Roman way. And just to say welcome Thank to you. people who are watching on YouTube, and over to you, Paul. Oh. <laughs> That's lovely. Thank you, Tricia, for those kind words. And it's very nice to be here. And thank you for uh, having me again. And thank you for giving up your morning to watch the uh, slideshow. Now, here we are in Orkney. And this picture is of the uh, famous Italian chapel. It was built by Italian prisoners of war uh, during the war years and finished in 1944. It's one of the great sites of Orkney. And uh, we'll see more about that a bit later. Now, first of all, a bit of a geography lesson. Um, there they are. Well, there's the, there are the islands of Orkney and the Shetland Isles up here. And bear in mind that in ancient days, the main form of transportation was by sea, uh, because there weren't roads, of course, in the way that we uh, expect them to be now. And any ships and merchants and so on coming from Eastern England and wanting to go around to the west of uh, Britain and Scotland, or coming from Europe, uh, Denmark, Scandinavia, Russia in here, Germany, North Germany here, and going uh, to Western Britain would have to go past Orkney and Shetland. And this made them very important places uh, for seamen in the early days. And of course, once the Pilgrim Fathers settled in America and the French in Canada, then the route to Canada and North America was via Orkney and Shetland, which explains their importance in, in, the, in the past. We always think of them as sort of out on a limb here from Britain, but they were vital stopping points from Europe in, in the old days. Now, here we are. Here's uh, Orkney, the islands of Orkney, and you can see they're very close to northern Scotland. Shetland is much further out, and Shetland is closer to Norway, in a way, than it is to Scotland. And, of course, both sets of islands were ruled by Norway uh, until the 15th century, when the king of Norway made an alliance with the king of Scotland, and as a dowry and so on, uh, those two sets of islands were passed over to Scotland in the 1400s. So here we are, here are the Orkney Islands. Uh, they're made up of, a, of about 60 islands. Uh, 20 of them are inhabited. Um, and the biggest island is this one here called Mainland. Uh, and down here, the second biggest island is the island of Hoy. Now, my journey on the bike took me all over mainland here, down to South Ronaldsay, one of the islands down here, across to Hoy, and then I took a boat up to here, to Westray, and then up to Papa Westray on the top here. Uh, and we'll see more of those a bit later. So here we are, the uh, crossing across to Orkney from the north of Scotland. And the port that I left from on this... Um, Ferry was the port of Stramster. It's not far from John O'Groats. And you can see the islands of Orkney are very close to Scotland. In fact, Hoy, and this is the island of Hoy here, this is only seven miles from the Scottish coast. Uh, and the, the stretch of water there is called the Pentland Firth. And it's where the tides of the North Sea and the Atlantic meet it can be one of the roughest stretches of water in the whole of Europe. It's known to be that. But you can see the day that I'm traveling there, it's perfectly calm and superb. And here's the ferry coming in, the North Link Ferry. And what you do, you take this ferry across to uh, the town of Stromness, which is it's a 90 minute uh, uh, sailing journey. And as you go towards Stromness, you come closer to the island of Hoy, and you see these sandstone cliffs. Uh, you, you, they're very uh, noticeable, of course. And standing on deck with me were loads of people, and we were all looking out for something. 
And as you get closer, you start to see it. You can't quite see it, and then you see it. The very famous old man of Hoy, the sea stack, which is a mecca for mountaineers around the world, uh, including Chris Bonington, and we'll hear more about him a bit later. And there she is, or he is, I should say, the old man of Hoy in silhouette. And here we are approaching Stromness. Uh, Stromness was founded in the 1590s to service ships going to uh, the Americas and, of course, the other side of uh, uh, Britain, Scotland and England, i.e. the West Coast. And uh, it was the capital of Orkney until it was taken over uh, 100 years ago or so by Kirkwall. And here is Stromness. Now, what amazed me is this is the high street in Stromness. I mean, it's an 18th century town, as you can see. Uh, fantastic. The, the high street, imagine that. And I got this picture from the internet from 1893 with these two young ladies. And if you go there today, it's virtually the same. Here we are, bike on back. Uh, and if you meet a lorry, of course, on that high street, that is very tricky. Somehow, there are ways of manoeuvring your way around each other, and, and this is what happens. Now, in Stromness, <clears throat> one of the sites is this well, this freshwater well, uh, which was there for seamen in the past, in the days of the sailing ships and so on. And on the, the left there, you can see a sign, and here it is. They watered here the Hudson's Bay Company ships, catching cooked vessels, uh, came here from Australia, the other side of the world, and Sir John Franklin's ship, the two ships Erebus and Terror, who went in search of the Northwest Passage in 1845, and they left uh, Stromness, and they were never, ever seen again. And that's one of the great mysteries of uh, Arctic travel. And we'll hear a bit more about those uh, in a moment. Uh, here we are, the Hudson's Bay Company. Uh, recruited Orkney men for service in Canada from this building. Now, uh, Orkney provided the labour for the Hudson's Bay Company, the, the, the whaling ships uh, and the exploratory ships that went out from the Hudson's Bay uh, in Canada. And 75% of the crews were from Orkney because they were always reckoned to be great sailors. And that building, which was the headquarters where they were employed and so on, is here. And it, today it's uh, an art gallery called the Pier Art Gallery. And this sculpture here is by Barbara Hepworth. And when you look at the, uh, that building, you see to the left of it there is a modern building. And this is part of the art gallery, the Pier Art Gallery. It's a nice place to visit uh, for modern paintings and so on. And the sculptures of Barbara Hepworth, because the lady who founded this peer art gallery in Stromness was a great pal of Barbara Hepworth. And that's why you see some of her sculptures in there. And just along from that art gallery is this statue. Now, this <laughs> is a man called Dr. John Ray, who was an Orcadian doctor. And he went out and joined the Hudson's Bay Company. And he it was who discovered, actually discovered, the Northwest Passage. And you, you saw reference earlier there to Sir John Franklin, who, whose ship disappeared. Well, it was John Ray who then discovered what had happened to those ships. And they were caught up in the ice, all the men died, uh, and it was reported by Eskimos that uh, some of the sailors on those ships started to cannibalize. And when John Ray got back to Britain and uh, told uh, the authorities this, he was in disgrace because Lady Franklin uh, couldn't believe that her husband would be in any way supportive of cannibalism. And uh, she uh, blackened John Ray's name, as did Charles Dickens, actually. And it's only in more recent years that John Ray has been sort of uh, recognised as the great man he was, the great Arctic explorer who told the truth and so on. And this is what he did. He founded the, or the route uh, of the Northwest Passage, which goes from the Atlantic here 
uh, right across the Arctic Circle, uh, through the waters here and out into the Bering Sea and into the Pacific here. And he was the one who actually sailed through and discovered it. If you go around this area, you will see uh, Ray Mountain, Ray Strait, the Ray Sea, and so on, all named after this Sir John Ray, this Orcadian. And here he is, the actual man himself, who died in 1893. And uh, his, his um, monument is actually in Westminster Abbey. There is a monument to him. Now, another building close by to where we've just been seeing is this rather unremarkable council house. And I took this photo because of that blue plaque on the wall. And here it is, to George Mackay Brown great Orcadian poet, one of the great poets of Scotland. And here he is. He was a, a strange man. He was agrophobic, totally agrophobic, and very, very shy until he had a few drinks inside him. And I'm sorry to say he was a very heavy drinker. His name was put forward as the successor to John Betjeman as the poet laureate on Betjeman's death. But he just couldn't face the idea of going to Edinburgh and London and the big cities as poet laureate. So he refused it. And the man who did take over from that was Ted Hughes. And even he said that it should have been Mackay Brown uh, because his poetry was so well regarded at that time. And this book, incidentally, <laughs> you can see at the top here, it says the best biography of a poet I've ever read by A.M. Wilson. It's a great book on George Mackay. Now, here's uh, the harbour in Stromness, and I'm showing you this picture because on the right, you can't see it, was a house. And here it is. And I have to, I have to tell you about this uh, house. Look at it. Three-storey house right on the harbour with a, a lovely conservatory there. Look at the price, £275,000. Now, this was only two years ago that I took this picture. Um, and so it gives you an idea of the standard of living or the cost of living in Orkney. And I should say at this stage that Orkney is often, is always recognised as one of the best places in Britain to live, partly because of that sense of community and also because there's a very low crime rate, uh, apparently, in Auckland. Um, so there we are. That's the place to go if you want a, a lovely house at a good price that we can all afford. And now, there I am sort of taking off now from Stromness, loaded down, as always. I never seem to be able to travel light. But I was spending a couple of weeks roaming around uh, 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 the Orkney Islands and then going up to Shetland. Um, but of course, I can't show Shetland on this talk because there's so much to talk about with Orkney. There we are, setting off with all the kit, tents, uh, in, uh, food and all the rest of it. Now, when you set off on the roads there, that's the sort of sign you love to see. Walking and cycling friendly road. Great. That's what we love as cyclists, as do us walkers as well. And one of the things that struck me in April, and I know Tricia would enjoy this because she's a great daffodil lover, um, but look at this, the roads, it, just along the way, so many daffodils, so many. Uh, it was a great sight. Now, here we are, the first place I'll visit from Stromness. Stromness is down here, and I'm heading up to this area, especially where that uh, star is and going on further up there, because these are the, where the great Neolithic sites of Orkney are. And there I'm heading uh, uh, over a causeway, and to the right of this picture and to the left of me is one of the great uh, settings for the standing stones of uh, Orkney. And here they are, the stones of Stenness. Now, this uh, picture was painted in around 1812 or so. And you can see there are about 12 stones. But today, when you go there, there are only four still standing. And it's on this peninsula. And this predates Stonehenge. 
And there we are going back across this causeway just beside those stones of Stenness. And you see those buildings there. Now, these are beside one of the greatest archaeological treasures in the world, certainly in Europe. And here it is. Now, when I passed it, it was covered in tiles, and which are holding down the tarpaulins during the winter. But in the summer months, for the last 10 years or more, it's been a great center for archaeologists, and they come from all over the world. Now, you may have seen recently on telly um, a repeat of Neil Oliver's program on the Neolithic sites of This is the center of it. And uh, Neil Oliver and fellow archaeologists claim that this was the greatest Neolithic site in uh, the Stone Age, the New Stone Age, and predates uh, Stonehenge, for example, and all the great Neolithic sites of Britain. And he maintains that what was developed here was then spread, the word was spread throughout the New Stone Age to the rest of Britain. Uh, and you've got archaeologists working on it constantly during the summer months. And when they've dug down deep to the foundations of this, it's called the Nest of Brodgar, by the way. And when you, they dug down deep, they found that the earliest stones were from 3,500 BC. That's over 5,000 years old. And uh, they, this gives it 500 years before Stonehenge was built. And that was the site, uh, stone houses uh, in those days, reconstructed, of course, by artists. And just along from there, now you see that uh, peninsula, I've come along that road and along this road here, and that uh, uh, nest of rock guys just there where the pointer is. And just along there is this fantastic ring of Brodgar. Uh, and look at it. Uh, to take a photo of it from the ground was not that easy to capture the whole thing, but here it is, the Ring of Brodgar. Stone Age site, um, there were originally 60 great stone uh, pieces of stone, now they're 27. And you have to ask yourself, in the new Stone Age, how did they possibly lift these stones, 60 of them, and put them into place? Where did they get them from, and so on. It's one of the great mysteries of uh, the Neolithic period. And here we are, the Ring of Brod. Now I'm on the bike, and by the way, I'm not loaded down here because I left my, all my kit in, the, in, in a hostel, actually, in, uh, in Stromnet. And now I'm headed on the bike along this road and to the coast here because I'm visiting, again, one of the great Neolithic sites of Orkney. And here it is, Skara Bray. It's the oldest lived-in settlement in the whole of Europe um, from the Stone Age period. And for thousands of years, about 4,000 years, it was covered in sand until uh, an archaeologist or uh, an amateur archaeologist from this great house here, Scale House, it started digging and he found the, the beginnings of the ruins of Skara Bray. But it, as I say, it was covered in sand, uh, and here it is. It's a collection of circular stone houses. And in, 19, in the 1920s, somehow the sand had retreated, and that's when the archaeologists really got going on uncovering it. And this is a photo taken in around 1925 when it was first. Uh, worked on by archaeologists. And you go there today and you see proper, proper rooms. And on that telly program the other day, Neil Oliver was waxing eloquent about these houses, saying, look, not only is it can you see the house without the roof, of course, but you've got furniture here. Like you've got a chest of um, a, a dresser where they kept all their kit and so on. You've got beds here where they, they obviously put straw down to lie on, and the beds are there. And in the middle, a huge, or a big, fireplace. Uh, so it must have been very kept very warm in the very cold winters of Orkney. And between each of those buildings, 
there are passageways and just about make one out here to the next building here. Uh, and there it is again. So Shara Bray, one of the great Neolithic sites of Orkney, dating from around 3,500 BC. And next to it, as I say, is this scale house. And this is where the laird of this area lived, who first discovered Skara Bray. And there's the house itself. And you go in there and it's a 16th century mansion and it's, uh, you know, quite well kitted out. It's a nice place to visit. And you've got the dining room here. And when I took this picture, I was amazed at what was behind me because in a cabinet just behind this chair here is this. China, a set of China, a dinner service. And you know where it came from? It came from Captain Cook himself because... In 1779, he had been murdered in Hawaii and his, his captain and his sailors and so on from his two ships came back to Britain via uh, Orkney and they stopped over here at Scale House because they were friends with the laird there and they donated the Captain Cook dinner service to Scale House. And there you are, you can see it uh, even today. Now, just along the way from there, we're looking at Neolithic sites, and just along the way there is this one, Maze How, it's called uh, a cairn or a tomb. And it doesn't look much from the outside. You, you see this great big uh, green hill. And you go in, you have to sort of really climb in almost under, uh, in this very small space into this cairn. And inside is a fantastic stone building. Now, again, you imagine in the Stone Age to lift these great uh, hunks of rock up this high without any kind of non uh, metal tools, just stone tools, uh, was a fantastic achievement. And, and these great pillars as well. And I got this photo actually from the internet because it shows the sun coming in on midwinter. It's positioned in such a way that the sun shines through on only one day virtually in the year. Now, another aspect of um, Orkney is that it's very agricultural. Um, and they say of Orkney people, or Orcadians as they're called, uh, Orcadians are farmers who have small boats, whereas in Shetland, the Shetlanders are fishermen with small crofts. So it, there's a big difference between Orkney agriculture and Shetland non agricultural. Another aspect of Orkney is its wind turbines, its windmills. And it is the foremost place, one of the foremost places in the world that use, uses green energy. And you see these windmills everywhere. Um, David Attenborough would be very proud, and I say this because I know of his strong connection with Leicester and the Attenborough family uh, in Leicester. And you see this, you see, you see these uh, wind farms all over the place, uh, and it's one of the great centres for the green uh, energy. Another thing you don't see in Orkney are trees. And I had to take this picture because this was the only little wood I saw. It's very bleak, uh, the landscape, and you just don't see trees. And, and the reason is that um, in Neolithic times, they got rid of, it, it was forested, uh, and it, they were removed during Neolithic times. And apparently the trees have never grown since because of the wind and all the rest of it, the climate of Orkney is not conducive to, to forestry. And there's a, an example of the sort of bleak landscape. But you see this water here. Now, this is one of the great natural harbours of the world. And it's called, uh, and by the way, I'm cycling between Stromness and Kirkwall. This, this road take, will take me to Kirkwall. Uh, and this is Scapa uh, Flow, the great natural harbour, surrounded as it is by islands, as you can see, all the way around. 
And Scarpa Flow, because of its enclosed position, was the base for the home British fleet, Royal Navy, during World War One. And there you see uh, it in Scarpa Flow. And one of the ships that was there at that time is this cruiser called HMS Hampshire. And going aboard that ship in 1916 was this man. He was boarding the ship uh, uh, for reasons we'll see in a moment. And he's in the middle there. I don't know if you recognize him. You'll perhaps recognize him better there, even better here, Lord Kitchener. Uh, he was Secretary of War during the First World War, the beginning of the First World War. And this is just after the Battle of Jutland in 1916. And just a couple of weeks, a few weeks later, he was sent up from London to uh, Orkney. He took the train up uh, to uh, Thurso and then took that ferry across the Pentonburg. And he went to Scarpa Flow, boarded that ship, the Hampshire, uh, and he was sailing to um, Russia to make an alliance with the Russians during the First World War. But just outside of Marwick Head, which is this picture of Marwick Head uh, near Skara Bray in Orkney, just outside of there, the ship hit a uh, German mine. And there, there it is, the Hampshire went down 735 i think sailors were drowned uh, after it hit the mine including kitchener and so when you go there today uh, this is one of the famous sites of that area this is the kitchener memorial uh, on a hill just overlooking marwick head but <laughs> it's just a, it's called the kitchener memorial and um, the locals decided, well, okay, poor old Kitchener's gone in this, uh, in this shipwreck, uh, but what about all those sailors, all those 730 odd? So in, 90, in 2016, which is 100 years after, 5th of June 1916, they've added the names of all the sailors who were drowned uh, in the HMS Hampshire in Scarpa Flow in 19. When you go there, you see one of the guns that was brought up from the ship. The wreck is still there, incidentally, but they brought up this gun, for example. And the propeller, uh, this is the propeller with divers around it. And if you go to the Scarpa Flow Museum uh, today, you will see that actual propeller from Kitchener's ship, the HMS Hampshire. By the way, the Lioness, um, it's in Lioness in Hoy, this uh, Scarpa Flow Museum. But when I was there, unfortunately, the museum itself was closed. So we weren't, a, or I wasn't able to go in there. Now, here we are, Scarpa Flow again, uh, with those islands surrounding it. Um, and there we are. Oh, yes, the um, Die Letzte Fahrt, the last journey. These are German warships in 1918, because after the armistice was signed and Germany surrendered, it was decided that all the German battleships would be taken by Britain and they were brought into Scarpa Flow. And here's a, a, a group of local Orcadians looking at the German fleet in Scarpa Flow. And that was in 1918 after the um, uh, armistice. But before the Treaty of Versailles was signed, the admiral of this German fleet, a man called Ludwig von Reuter, tried to, to scuttle the German ship. He didn't want the British to have them. Uh, and so all the ships, there were 74 ships in the harbour at that time, and they were all scuttled. And this is a picture taken in the 1920s or 1930s where they raised up many of those ships um, because they were a danger to ships in the interwar period. But of course, there are seven ships still in the, at the bottom in Scarpa Flow, one of the great meccas uh, underwater diving. Uh, and they come from all over the world to dive among the wrecks of these German battleships in Scarpa Flow. Here, for example. 
as the Second World War approached, uh, or in the later 1930s, it was realised that um, we've got to really uh, provide defences to um, uh, to Sarpa Flow, and so they sank a uh, ship in the entrances to the, to the flow itself, um, and they put in uh, anti-submarine netting because there was a fear of U-boats, Unterseeboats, coming into Scarpa Flow and hitting the home fleet, which in the Second World War was also based in Scarpa Flow. So you see this netting here, for example, and here are some ladies making the netting, when you go to that Linus War Museum or the, the Scarpa Flow uh, Museum, uh, you can see the netting today. As I say, I, you couldn't go in there, but um, you can see this sort of thing around out. And there are some of the block ships that uh, are in front of the openings to those islands into Scarpa Flow. And they, you can still see them today. They were put there in the 30s to keep out any U-boats who might get into Scarpa Flow. Now, on that note, seeing as we're nearly at break time, I'll press pause there, because later we'll see one of the consequences uh, of what happened in Scarpa Flow. And then I want to introduce you to one of the great stories of Orkney, which amazed me, and it's the story of America's most richest heiress in the interwar years. I'll tell you all about her uh, a little bit later. So we'll pause there, Tricia, if, if we can. Is that okay? You can see these block ships, which made yeah. Scarpa Flow basically invulnerable. Uh, so they thought, but then the great tragedy happened. This battleship is called the Royal Oak. And here it is in Malta, uh, in the 1930s, and here it is in its home port of Portsmouth, and you can see HMS Victory in the back there. Well, this was stationed inside Scarpa Flow at the beginning of the war. But then, along and there were 1,200 men on board, sailors. And then along came this U-boat, U-47, uh, Unterseeboat 47, and it came through, it snuck in through the barriers and the uh, block ships and so on into Scarpa Flow. It fired off three torpedoes at the Royal Oak. It was a high tide, it was a moonless night, and somehow they weren't seen. The, the uh, U-boat wasn't seen, and the ship was torpedoed. 833 sailors uh, were killed, either in the explosion or drowned. And it, this included 134 boys, sailor boys, who or boy sailors, who were aged between 15 and 17. It was a terrible event, and it happened in October 1939. Now, that was just a few weeks after the outbreak of war, before there'd been any bombing in England or Britain or anywhere. And it was a terrible morale destroyer, really, at the beginning of the war. But in Germany, and this picture I got from the internet, it shows the U-47 returning to uh, a German port, and it had a hero's welcome. It, this was a great victory for Nazi Germany. And the, the captain of that U-boat is this man, Gunther Prim, and he was given the highest... Uh, military honours by Adolf Hitler in 1939, October 1939. But two years later, in 1941, he was killed uh, as well. So this was the nature of war at that time. Now, because of that Royal Oak disaster, oh, and by the way, before we get on to that, here are some of the sailors who escaped uh, from that uh, awful business. And they're not the sailors in uniform because the sailors, this was the day after virtually, uh, sailors who were on board the Royal Oak, uh, they lost all their kit. Because it happened in the middle of the night, they were mainly in bed. And so they're in boiler suits and you can see some of them here in their boiler suits. And you see that oil tanker there, if you go there today, there it is, that same oil tank. And there were many oil tanks on Hawaii to uh, 
support the, the battleships. Um, and the oil, incidentally, didn't come from the Middle East at the, because the war was on. It came from Venezuela, so a little. And there's the oil oak on the sea bottom. It's 100 feet down, lying on the bottom at Scarborough Bow. This is an artist's reconstruction, but it is now, or ever since then, it's been a war grave. Nobody is allowed to dive to it because it's a war grave and there's still bodies in there. But every year, uh, a Royal Navy or two Royal Navy, Navy divers go down on the anniversary and they plant uh, a white ensign on the stern of the Royal Oak. And if you look out, as I was looking out at Scarpa Flow today, you see that boy, that's where the Royal Oak is lying as a war grave under the water there. And you see the boy close up as about the Royal Oak on, on writing there. And when you go to the Royal Naval Cemetery on Hoy, you see all the graves of those sailors or some of the sailors who, who died in that attack on the Royal Oak. There we are. I don't know if you can read it there. 14th of October 1939, HMS Royal Oak. And by the way, in that cemetery, there are also some German graves. You see Ein Deutscher Soldat, a German soldier, because when the Germans settled their ships in 1919, some of the Germans were killed by uh, Navy personnel who were so sort of anti-German at that stage in 1919, you see their graves. And there you see a memorial to the Hampshire, Kitchener's ship, you remember, with certain graves there from the Hampshire. Now, that was terrible, that the sinking of the Royal Oak. So Churchill decided, right, we have to create a barrier. And by the way, the Royal, that Punta Sabo had come through here. Do you see my little red thing? And the Royal Oak was stationed in the middle there somewhere, but he, it, it snuck in through here. So Churchill decided we've got to have barriers, and they're called the Churchill Barriers, and there are four of them, one two, three, four, between those islands uh, to provide greater defence against any U-boat coming through again. And there are the, there's one of the Churchill barriers, and you can still see the block ships out there, and there's the barrier to the right there. Huge great granite uh, um, stones were placed there, boulders were placed there, and the work was done by these men, Italian prisoners of war. Um, there were uh, 500 or so, and they were stationed on Lamb Holm, one of the islands between the Churchill barriers. And here they are. And I want you just to notice in particular this man on the left, uh, who was the great hero of what I'm gonna tell you now, because these men, when they were stationed on Lamb Holm, they were stationed in Nissen huts. And uh, by the way, there's there's the uh, there's the um, where they were stationed, and there's the Churchill barriers and the ship and you know that U-boat had come here. But anyway, they were stationed in Nissen huts, and they decided they wanted a Roman Catholic church, and so they were allowed to make one out of two Nissen huts, and these are two Nissen huts joined together. In front of it, there it is, built out of concrete, because there was plenty of concrete around at that time to build the virtual barriers, they built the Italian chapel. And there it is. Now, when you just go inside the front door and look back at the front door, this is a scene. It's fantastic artwork. Trompe d'oeil, if, if you know what that means, you know, it's look as if it's real uh, in-depth uh, building. Uh, and you see the brickwork to look like real bricks. Fantastic. And you look inside at the altar, and there it is. Uh, and you see the ironwork there, made by these Italian prisoners of war. And you see those lamps hanging up, for example. They were made, those two lamps, you see that, and some of the other metalwork was made out of corned beef tins. <laughs> And the great artist who did this is that man I showed you on the left there in that earlier picture. And here he is, Domenico uh, Chiochetti, who was a, basically a peasant man from the Dolomites, a great artist. And he it was who designed and uh, did all the artwork uh, for the Italian chapel. 
the man on the right actually was uh, uh, um, uh, <laughs> he did the ironwork uh, that we saw earlier. Now, when you go to uh, Scarpa Flow today, you don't see any battleships, but you do see oil rigs because we're close to the North Sea oil uh, areas, and you see these rigs in the, on Scarpa Flow. Uh, but you also see, you don't see battleships, but you see some very pretty sort of fishing boats every so often, like this one or this one. I talked to a fisherman, and here he is. He was 53, he told me, and he'd been fishing Scarpa Flow for 30 years. And his main catch was lobster and langoustine. And <laughs> I interviewed him because I wanted to hear what the Orcadian accent is like. Uh, it, it, it's different from Scottish. And let's hope we can hear him now. Come on, spent all my life doing it. And what's your day like? A working day? Well, I. I'm not the type of body who'll be going to sit in the there nothing all day you can. I like being doing something all day to get me out of the house. Yeah. I couldn't have sat in the house all day. I think it would drive me scotty. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, I think the wife and the leg it either, so. <laughs> I've come down on the bike down from Kirkwall, which is above here somewhere, uh, and I've come across the Churchill Barriers, and I'm visiting now St Margaret's Hope. And this is the island of South Ronaldsay. Uh, and there's a great story here. But here we are, St. Margaret's Hope, a little sort of 18th century town, right on the Scarpa Flow. Very nautical, as you can see on one of the doors there. And I went to this uh, museum, this little museum, and talked to this man who was a sort of volunteer in charge. His name was John. And he'd lived there all his life in St Margaret's Hope. And he showed me a picture of him when he was at school with all the fellow school kids. And here he is on the left here, uh, John. And he said to me, 80% of those people in that picture have left Orkney. You know, they didn't stay. They sought their fortune in uh, Scotland or further afield. But he said, you must go to the shop uh, next door, the cafe next door, because in the window was this book. And uh, <laughs> the cafe was closed, so I couldn't uh, get hold of it. But I got hold of it in the library a bit later. And it's about this woman. Amazing. What a story. Cornelia Stuyvesant Vanderbilt. She was the richest heiress in America in the 1920s and, and afterwards. And her house which she inherited is the Biltmore Estate in North Carolina. This is the uh, largest, wealthiest, uh, privately owned building in the whole of the USA. Today, I think. Um, and that was hers. Can you hear me okay? That was hers. And here she is on her wedding day on the left uh, in the 1920s. And she married an Englishman, uh, Aaron uh, Cecil, Etonian and Oxford. He was a diplomat in the Washington Embassy. And uh, yeah, that, that was her husband, <laughs> um, Cecil. And he was descended, incidentally, from William Cecil, who was the first minister of Queen Elizabeth I, so a very aristocratic family. Uh, and they were together for a few years, and then she got fed up with being married, is Cornelia. And she took off and she went to Greenwich Village in New York and became a, a, a studied art. And here she is. She dyed her hair red, <laughs> changed her name to Nilcha, and <laughs> she went to live in uh, New York and then in Paris. And then in London, and in London, she remarried another aristocrat from Eton and Oxford, uh, and they were happily married for 20 years. She lived in Oxford, but she had a flat in the Fulham Road in London, and her husband died. And then <laughs> in 1973, when she was 70-odd, uh, 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 she fell in, she went to a... Um, uh, a restaurant in the Fulham Road, and she fell in with this man in the middle, who was, whose name was Bill Goodsir, and he was from Mar St Margaret's Hope in Orkney. 
and he was looked on as the uh, a bit of a playboy you know he was a, a um a male model and a film extra in uh, london in those days and that's his sister on the right and there's cornelia on the left and they got married she was 70 odd and he was 46 <laughs> going to the name again to mary uh, and uh, that was it. She was now married to this Bill Goodser from Orkney. <laughs> and um, she died at the age of uh, 70, in 1976, at the age of 76. He uh, went on and lived a bit longer. And then in Fulham Road, in their apartment, he hanged himself. And that was the end of uh, Bill Goodser in the middle there. And so his body was brought back to St Margaret's Hope and he was buried in the family grave, St Peter's Kirk, just outside of St Margaret's Hope, right on the sea there. Uh, and that's where his grave is. Now, a Cornelia, what turned up there was this. Here lies the dust of Cornelia Vanderbilt, the richest woman in America, or had been. And how that got there, nobody knows, but the dust was put onto the grave of uh, Bill Goodser in that little tiny cemetery in um, St Margaret's Hope in Orkney. But what a story there about the great wealth that can lead to this. Uh, poor old Cornelia, but she apparently was a very happy sort of woman and uh, very involved in helping the poor and all the rest of it, you know. So, uh, an interesting story there. Now, here we are back in uh, looking at or the Orkney Islands again. Now, my next trip, I think it's the next trip, is to go, let's have a look. Where are we going to now? Oh, yes, back in Kirkwall. I'm in Kirkwall now. And again, a lovely old 18th century town. This is the main street of Kirkwall on a wet day. Uh, and you see the wooden board along the house here, you know, in case a lorry or something comes around and hits those windows. Uh, and there's some historic buildings, great historic buildings. This is the Earl's Palace in Kirkwall. And this is the great piece de resistance of the building, which is uh, St Magnus Cathedral. Now, bear in mind, I mean, Orkney only has a population of 22,000, and yet they have this great cathedral. And you go inside and it's quite a sight. And it's called St Magnus Cathedral after this man, who was the Earl of Orkney uh, in the 12th century, St Magnus. And he was murdered by his cousin, who wanted him with an axe on the head, apparently, according to tradition. And this is an embroidery that was in the cathedral. And then, amazingly, in 1919, when they were doing renovation work on the cathedral, they found this coffin. And this is a photo, that's in the museum now. But you see this photo taken in 1919. It's of the bones of St. Magnus uh, with that axe hole in the skull there. Can you just see it there? And his bones. And if you go around that cathedral, you see this sign. Within this pillar lie the remains of Magnus Ellenson, Earl of Orkney who 1115 was slain on the island of Eaglesay in Orkney, and he was canonised 1133, and in his memory, his nephew, Ron Valt, built this cathedral. So in the 12th century, it's been there since the 12th century. And that pillar that I just mentioned, inside there are the bones of St Magnus. And one of the other uh, memorials in that cathedral is the memorial to Sir John Ray. Do you remember we talked about him earlier? Uh, the great explorer, Arctic explorer, who set off from Stromness and uh, founded or found the Northwest Passage. There he is. There's also uh, a monument to the, a memorial rather, to the Royal Oak, uh, to the men of the Royal Oak, 833 officers and men, who lost their lives 14 October 1939 and here it is and that bell you know I told you it's uh, it's uh, a war grave but they did remove the bell and put it in the cathedral then renovated it and so on uh, a few years ago now outside the cathedral, uh, cathedral I was walking along in the high street here of Kirkwall and this group of lads 
went past banging drums and shouting. And I realised, or I found out later, that this was one of the ceremonies of Orkney. Now, Orkney has very traditional things that are unique to Orkney, and this is called the blackening uh, ceremony. And these men, they cover themselves in tar, and they drink, they beat the drum, and it's because one of their mates is getting married. And I'm not sure which one was the groom, if it's any one of these. But what they do, they, they have this ceremony and they end up stripping the groom to be and they chuck him in the sea there in Orkney. And that's one of the ceremonies of uh, traditional Orkney still going on. This is another tradition of Orkney. These, this is the Polar Bear Club. And every day of the year, winter and summer, some in wetsuits, some not, they swim uh, around the uh, various uh, uh, beaches. Uh, and this is another tradition. I, I didn't take this picture, because this is from the internet. This is on Christmas Day and New Year's Day. It's called the bar game, or the ball game. And two groups of men, about 100 in each uh, group from different parts of the town, they play this football game to get the ball uh, one end or the other. It's got a very famous bar game of Orkney. And here is just a final kind of tradition of Orkney. These are the girls of the Festival of the Horse, which happens in South Ronaldsay, only South Ronaldsay, at St Margaret's Hope, which we've just been to. And every year in August, one Saturday, they have this ceremony. The boys do a ploughing competition, and the girls dress in, as horses with the harness and the sort of horse head on their heads and so on. It's one of the traditions of Orkney. And another great tradition is the Orkney chair. And I went to this chap house where he and his wife have been making or traditional Orkney chairs for 30 years. And apparently the Queen Mother was a great fan of these Orkney chairs. You can see the straw that's used, you can see it at the back there, used on the back, and then they use wood. And I said to the man, well, how come traditionally the chairs have been made with wood when you've got no wood in, um, in no forests in Orkney? Where did it come from traditionally? He said, one place. Oh, sorry, there's an Orkney chair uh, underneath it, as you see. And he showed me the wood here, uh, which he was going to make the Orkney chairs from. Uh, and he said it only comes from one source that you might guess. Yes, driftwood. Uh, there's come up some of it from America, across the Atlantic and so on. You see this driftwood uh, on the beaches there of Orkney. And that's what the Orkney chair is made from. And here they are. And he said they, they cost, um, I mean, they're very expensive because they take three weeks to make. And I said, well, how much are they? And he said, well, the ordinary ones are about 1,200 pounds. Uh, this one with a high back is the uh, ladies chair, because traditionally, again, because the is very drafty, they've got a sort of roof to the chair, as you can see there. Now, the next part of the journey is to go from, I've come back to from Kirkwall, which is here, I've gone back to Stromness, and I'm taking the boat across to Hoy there, and then I'm crossing uh, Hoy to here, which we'll see in a moment. So there's the little ferry, again, a lovely sunny day with nice clear blue water, uh, not rough at all, uh, heading off to Hoy. And then you come towards Hoy, and you see that great mountain behind, because of all the islands on Orkney, Hoy is the one mountainous one, uh, and there it is. And then, going towards Rackwick Bay, I see this site, this path leading to that stone, whatever it is, and here it is. It's called the famous Dwarfy Stone, again, a Neolithic burial tomb. And you go inside that hole there, and that's the inside, and you can see it's been carved out on the right as, as a tomb. And you see this ledge here, for example. Now, this was made by Stone Age man, women, uh, 3,000 years BC. 
amazing. How did they carve it out without uh, without metal implements or tools other than stone tools? Amazing. And there it is, the famous dwarfy stain spoon. Then you come to Rackwick Bay, and the colour of that water, I've seen it in the uh, Maldives and so on, but here we are in Orkney. Look at the colour of that water. And some of the houses there on Rackwick Bay are these traditional Orcadian houses with these fantastic tiled roofs, great slabs of stone to make the tile. And inside, this is an example there, and you see that Orkney chair in the, the end there. Uh, and here's another house. Now, one of the residents here in Rackwick Bay, amazing, is this man, Peter Maxwell Davis. Now, those of you who know their music will recognise the name because he was the uh, composer and conductor of the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra in London, the BBC Philharmonic. He was the master of the Queen's music. And he got fed up with living in London and being around the South, and he wanted to live in Orkney, and got that house in Rackwick Bay. Uh, and he was a great friend of George Mackay Brown, that poet we talked about earlier. And he set some of his music to Brown's poetry, uh, which you can still hear today. So there he is, Peter Maxwell Davis in Orkney at Rackwick Bay. Now, Rackwick Bay is on the left here. And what I'm going to do now is to walk to the Old Man of Hoy. Uh, and as it says there, it's a three-hour journey for the return journey. And there it is. You follow this path and cross over this sort of barren landscape and you get to the Old Man of Hoy. And there's the Old Man of Hoy on the left. I mean, sorry, on the right. A huge, great uh, sea stack it is. And there it is. You get a sense of the height of it. And to think people actually climb it. And by the way, in 1817, I think, it was painted by this painter, this artist. And you see it's got two feet at the bottom. Well, they don't exist anymore. And people say that the old man of Hoy will eventually disappear. Uh, but there it is. Now, I've shown that arrow there because when I was standing there, there were two people. You can't see them. It, the scale is so big that you can't actually see them, but they're down there and they're climbing the old man of Hoy. And here they are, close. But the one who is most famous with the old man of Hoy is this man, Chris Bonington. He climbed it in 1966 uh, when he was a young man, and 40 odd years later, when he was 80, about five years ago, uh, he climbed it again. I mean, how he got up here at the age of 80, and there he is, that picture was taken on his, basically his 80th birthday, just a few years ago, at the top, the old man of Hoy. Now I'm cycling back across uh, Hoy, and I go on another little trip across Hoy, and I come to this place. I don't know if you can see it at the back there. I think covering it on my screen here. Um, there it is. It's a grave. It's the remotest grave in the whole of Britain. And it's the grave of Betty Corrigan. She was a 27-year-old in the 1770s. And she fell in with this chap, fell in love with him. They had a baby. And then he took off and he went to sea. And so she, desperate, unmarried mum, which was beyond the pale in those days, she tried to commit suicide. She tried to drown herself, but was saved. And then uh, a little bit later, she hanged herself successfully. And it was so sort of out of favour in the local Hoy community. Um, but she was an unmarried mum. And uh, because, uh, yes, she was an unmarried mum and had this baby. Um, they buried her in the... Um, uh, in this uh, landscape, the moat. And just a few years ago, her body was, uh, because this is peat, this is all peat bog, her body was preserved and, and she was found uh, there without any gravestone or anything. A few years ago, uh, somebody made this gravestone for her and surrounded it with that fence. 
you think it would be a stone, but it's not. It's a fiberglass. I'm just amazed seeing this this grave uh, in fiberglass, the remotest grave in the British Isles. Amazing. Poor old Betty. Now, the next stage of the journey is to go from Kirkwall here, take a boat through the harbour of Kirkwall, and then up to the island of Westray, and then across to the upper Westray, the small island just above it. And as I was leaving Kirkwall on the, on the ferry, what an amazing sight. Here it was, a <laughs> great cruise ship. Because, as you perhaps know, Orkney is the most popular cruise destination in the British Isles. In 2019, which was the year after I was there, there were expected to be 170 cruise ships coming into Kirkwall uh, that summer. And uh, what a sight it is. Uh, last year, I imagine there probably weren't any because of COVID, and you wonder how many there'll be this year. There's another view of that same ship, but this is, it's, it, they built a new sort of harbour for it, just outside of Kirkwall, and there it is, and it houses these um, cruise ships. And you imagine thousands of people on board going around uh, Kirkwall and Orkney. It really affects the community. The reason Kirkwall, the reason Orkney is so famous as a cruise destination is there's so much to see that you can do in a day, you know, if you've got a motor vehicle on um, one of these cruise trips, you can imagine. And then I get up to West, uh, Westray, and there it is, typical road in Westray with lots of daffodils again in April. Uh, and uh, it's not a very good photo of this, but I did a selfie here, holding up that hanky, just showing the wind, and it doesn't really compare, but I was fighting against a really foul head uh, get to the other end of Westray. Uh, and I get to this castle, Maltland Castle on Westray. And it was built by a man called Sir Gilbert Alpha in the 16th century. And he was the master of the household of Mary, Queen of Scots. And you ask yourself, when you're in there, <laughs> in this castle, did Mary, Queen of Scots come here? She possibly did, but of course it wouldn't have looked like that when she was there. And not a castle, but there's my home on uh, Westray, and you can see that rainbow there. Of course, the weather changes uh, very much uh, uh, within a day, often uh, on or. And where my tent is, is a place called Purewall, which is the village, the main village on Westray. And this is outside, they've got a little museum there, and this is outside the museum. You see all these anchors from the ships that had. Uh, been or been shipwrecked in that area and you also see this i thought it was a whale bone but it's actually dinosaur bone just outside of that uh, museum in, in pyramid one of the things in the museum which i enjoyed seeing was this famous westray wife uh, and you can see it's a woman because of the breasts there and this is the first ever it's neolithic the first ever uh, sculpture of a female in European history, basically. Still there in that museum. One of the visitors to that museum in, uh, I think it's 1970, I can't see it at the top, is the Queen and the Duke. The Duke is very well at that stage. I have to show you this picture. It's not often we see the actually hilariously laughing, uh, but they were there on a visit to this little place, Pure Wall, in Westray. And now to get across to Papa Westray, I'm going from Westray, the island of Westray, yeah. to the island of Papa Westray. And one of the ways of doing it is to take this flight, and this is the shortest scheduled flight in the world, and it goes from Westray to Papa Westray, it takes two minutes. But of course, because I've got the bike, I'm not going on that plane. Uh, the, reason, the way I get across is by this little ferry, which goes 
every day between Westray and Papa Westray. And the main reason it goes is to take school kids from Papa Westray, where there's no school, to Westray, where there is a school. Uh, but when I was doing it, there was just one kid, one young girl in about the fifth form, going back and forth uh, on the boat to school. Now, here we are in, in Papa Westray, and I want to visit this uh, again, a Neolithic site, and it's the oldest known farmstead in Orkney. It predates even Scara Bray. And to get there, I park the bike against this fence, and I have to walk across this field, and I walk along here, and the cattle, when I arrive, I've taken this after I've finished the walk, but um, when I uh, was walking there, these cattle weren't eating, actually, and they were sort of just in the field. And one of them, it looked very masculine. It must have been a heifer. I don't think it was a bull. But it chased me. And I was so scared. I had to run for it to get out of the, west, the way of this big black cattle, cow, whatever it was. And anyway, what I'm doing is going down to the uh, sea here and there. I find this. This is the map of Hauer. Uh, and here it is. Again, Neolithic houses, which used to be covered in stone, and they predate even Scara Bray. They're on this remote island of Wastre. That's where Stone Age man must have lived in, uh, you know, 3000 BC, we're talking about. The beaches there are superb, lovely white um, uh, sand. Uh, shell sand it is, uh, and there you see it, and of course inside <laughs> in the water there, the odd seal, I was pleased to see, there he is. And um, I, I don't know much about bird names, I wish I knew more, but I do know the name of that bird on the left, which is the eider duck, with its uh, mate. And do you remember we used to use eider downs in the old days before, um, you know, the present uh, bedding, uh, and that's the eider duck. These are fulmars, which you see on the cliff faces everywhere, fulmar bird. And I don't know what this one is, some sort of duck or whatever, uh, and I couldn't find the name of it, which I knew. I'm sure there are birders in the audience who know that. Uh, and this is the curlew uh, with that long beak, fantastic. This bird, Oh dear, the great skewer. And I say, oh dear, it's called the Bonksy in um, Orkney and in Shetland. And it is a vicious bird. It's a great big bird. And it will attack other birds, birds' nests, and so on. And it will even attack humans. This one stayed very calm and he didn't attack me at all. So I was okay. I nearly got attacked in Shetland, by the way, by a great skewer. But more of that later. The bird to see, of course, wonderful. First time I'd ever seen them, uh, and they were on one of the cliffs in Orkney. And there's just a few of them at this stage because don't forget we're in April and they are only beginning to come to land to build their nests to give birth during the summer, uh, the young puffins. And they're very small birds. I was amazed how small they are, but what a sight. I mean, it's a stunning sight to see these. Uh, lovely puffins with their multicolored beaks. And I had to laugh at this, no puffins. Now, final little story. This brings me to the end, really. Uh, I want to introduce you to this man on the right here. His name was Jay, and his workmate is on the left. And you know, you saw my tent earlier. Well, the second night, it was so wet and it was so windy, I couldn't stay in the tent overnight. So I moved into the hostel, which was near me, close to where the tent was. And that evening, I got chatting to this chap, Jay, who was like a sort of middle-aged hippie. But he, he worked on one of the oil rigs or something, and we got chatting. And I said to him, in the morning, I've got to get back to the ferry at the other end of Westray uh, to get back to Kirkwall. And there's only one ferry a day, and it leaves at nine o'clock, and I've got a cycle there, and it's eight miles, and, you know, there's a headwind and there's rain and so on. He said, don't worry, no problem, he said. We'll take you in our van. As long as I can get rid of all the red floats in my van, 
uh, that evening. I'll get it ready and we'll get you to that ferry. So him and his mate there, Jay and his mate, they loaded my bike, fully loaded, into the back of this van at about 8.30, 20 past 8. And at 9 o'clock, I was able to board the ferry. And I missed it against the headwind and the rain. Um, it, there was only one ferry a day. So what a saviour he was. Good old Jay. Lovely man. Talk about the kindness of strangers. And his friend, his mate there. Uh, they were so helpful and lovely. Now, they took me back to Kirkwall, or they took me to the ferry. I went back to Kirkwall, and I spent that evening in the sun again, uh, next to the cathedral, St Magnus Cathedral, at this place called Griel. Now, Orcadians are great music makers, and um, this is the centre for Orcadian music. They have uh, music classes, singing, instrumental classes, they have performances and so on. And it's like a sort of pub, you know, right in the middle of Kirkwall. And it was set up by these two sisters who were international folk singers from Kirkwall, the Wrigley sisters, one on guitar, one on violin. Uh, but I won't play their music just now, but I want to play you a little piece of music from the Orcadian Folk Festival uh, to accompany some final photographs to give you an idea of the landscape of um, So there we are. That brings us to the end of uh, the talk. I hope you've enjoyed it. This is Rackwick Bay, by the way, and you can see in the distance that's John O'Groats over there, somewhere along the coast there, and you can see Scotland, see how close it is. But Orkney in this staycation age is a fabulous place to go to if you like uh, scenery and beaches and history in particular, both of the World Wars and Neolithic history, as you Anyway, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. I certainly enjoyed reliving the journey that I did a couple of years ago. Um, and thank you for your time and all good wishes to all of you. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Um, yeah, there we are. Yeah, that's lovely. It's, that, that was oh, yeah, I spectacular. I and we've had so many people. We're so riveted. They've, we've had so many people here. And,